Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our new course here um, that we're going to be teaching over the next uh, few weeks, uh, if I can, uh, in person and then also just uh, by recording. So just here on layover in Hong Kong, just on the island, uh, one of my favorite places in the world. You can just uh, see here's um, Harbor and uh, we have a really nice hotel here uh, on the island. Usually I've just been in Kowloon all these years. I haven't been to um, Hong Kong for a number of months. So it's really, really nice to be back. And hopefully the video is going to be okay. So I'm shooting the video here just with the lighting and everything in the um, hotel room. So I'm not so good. So hopefully it's going to be all right. And you know, just before we start, um, uh, what we're going to be doing this course on is an examination. It's, I'm going to try and keep it fairly short. There's a new book well, I shouldn't say it's a new book. It's been out for a number of years, but a new book that I'm looking at uh, on called The Two Truths uh, by Debate of the Two Truths. So even just that I'm just having it there, you can just see on the video uh, what it is if you just put, um, there's a few books on it now in Tibetan Buddhism about uh, sort of two different schools of emptiness here, the two sort of main, I guess, influential views on emptiness, which um, what they usually call um, either Rantong and Shantong, in other words, emptiness of self and emptiness of other, just two ways of understanding the relationship between two truths or the unity uh, uh, between uh, conventional and ultimate reality, what that relationship is like. So this book uh, is by a great uh, uh, Tibetan um, scholar, and I think he teaches in Australia, so um, Tamcho, and you can see the, um, again, his biography or whatever. And there's actually, I think there's a few books on this, or a couple books anyway, but this one's very, very good. And um, it, so what it looks at, and we'll get into a little bit more detail here, is between, obviously, uh, one of uh, Tibet's uh, greatest saints, one of the great saints of the Buddhist world, and great scholars of the Buddhist world, founder of our Galupa tradition, Jason Kapalo Sangdragpa um, from the Glupa tradition, founder of the Glupa tradition. And then uh, Gorampa, who was a famous Sakya scholar who lived after Song Kappa, is quite critical of him. So what was interesting is that it shows two main currents uh, of um, scholarship, I guess, or two different views of emptiness, the emptiness of self, um, a viewpoint on the two truths, and emptiness of what they call emptiness of other, Shantong, view of the two truths. Um, the emptiness of other sort of um, being founded, uh, sort of codified, I guess you could say, by a very famous um, Sakya Lama from Western Tibet, Topopa. And um, Jeffrey Hopkins has written a number of um, books on, on him, I believe you can look at. There's a really, really good one we have, um, Mountain Doctrine. That's sort of his main book that you can, that you can get. Anyway, so what it shows is that within the Sakya tradition itself, one of the four great traditions of Tibetan Buddhism, there was this very sort of active debate on, um, I guess, the nature and understanding, because I guess the ontology and epistemology around emptiness, that you have these two kinds of currents. Um, and so Jason Kappa, his teacher, um, Rindawa, was a very, very famous Sakya uh, scholar. And I think Lama Umapa was another one. They sort of felt their, their scholarship and their practice, what they liked, fell in this more of the sort of traditional sort of Indian presentation that you get that so popular, the sort of emptiness of self uh, tradition, right, the Rantong tradition. And then Gorampa coming after, um, in the second, just coming after J. Sankapa, sort of continued Dopopa's um, sort of emptiness of other um, view. And, and it's quite, J. Sankapa is quite critical of Dopopa's emptiness of other view and forwarding his emptiness of self view. After uh, he passed into Parinirvana, Gorampa comes along and starts criticizing, well, just critiquing his big, big scholarly debate, Jason Kappa's view. And then that became very, very popular. And so the Shentong view that you'll see, uh, or emptiness of other view, uh, was also forwarded by Third Karmapa, uh, Ranjing Georgi, and very, a lot of famous uh, Nyingma and Kagyu scholars until the um, coming into uh, the 19th century in the Rime tradition. And then I don't have time. I'm not a Tibetan scholar, and this would I mean we could spend the rest of our lives arguing this and researching and reading books. But Jumipam Rinpoche, at the end of the 19th century, was one of perhaps the greatest. Sometimes even say um, I shouldn't say the greatest uh, Nyingma scholar because it's a uh, Longchenpa would be that. They, Rinpoche, my lama says Rinpoche always says there's three, three great um, manifestations of the Buddhist uh, Buddha wisdom in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. So uh, Sakya Pandita, the great Sakya Lama, who in a lot of ways is the prototype for laying down a lot of the ideas that would become popular as the emptiness of other school. That, that, that's, it's 
before Joel Pulpitz, before that, but a lot of his views on emptiness and, and also uh, concept formation, the relation between the mind and the world, end up becoming taken up by later writers in the Shentong view of emptiness. And so um, it's um, George Dreyfus, that famous um, Tibetan scholar uh, and professor, he wrote a book called Recognizing Reality, excellent book, looking on the Galupa um, or Jason Kappa's understanding of Sakyapandita's presentation on emptiness, which you it's a very, very good, very, very thick book, you might not want to read it. But um, so anyway, that's sort of coming down the line. And then um, so you've got um, Sakya Pandita, then Lonchenpa, who is sort of like the great revital revitalizer and codifier of the Nyingma tradition. And who's just basically contemporaneous with Jay Song Kappa, just uh, passed an imperial event just before Song Kappa did. But they weren't in communication. In a lot of ways, it's one of the great missed opportunities karmically. It's almost like two great boxers or great painters m missing one another's work. So you can't, they can't respond to one another, comment on one another. It sort of comes later on, centuries later, where their followers and scholars end up doing these debates. But Jumipam Rinpoche ends up, um, so the other third aspect of Manjushri course is Jason Kappa. So Jumipam uh, Rinpoche in the 19th century, one of the great luminaries of the Rime tradition in Eastern Tibet, writes a lot on this precise uh, debate between Rantong and Shentong, and it, it takes up Gorampa's view and criticizing Tsongkhapa's view of emptiness of self, but at the same time forwards his own view, which is really, really unique, and that's become almost like the in the Kagyu Nyingma tradition, both of those, but especially the Nyingma tradition, almost like the dominant view now of an understanding of emptiness. It's really, really good. I haven't read Mipam Rinpoche very, very little. I'm not going to say anything about it because I'll just make it make a total ass of myself because I don't know what I'm talking about. But again, and again, I'm not a scholar. I mean, even if I'm commenting on Gorampa or Sankap, it's just what I've read. You know, I have an MA philosophy, but I don't have an MA PhD or anything in religious studies in Tibetan Buddhism or anything else. I'm just a guy. I'm just a flight attendant, as I always like to say, serving junk food and picking up garbage. So by you, I've got a very amateur understanding of this stuff. But what I always like doing is just getting people interested in the material. And if you have the time, you have the inclination, the curiosity, the interest, and most of all, the effort, you can start doing your own research, talking to lamas, reading scholars, and looking into this. But I thought it might be a fun way of introducing um, this idea, um, these I, the, the ideas on the two sort of, I guess, in Tibetan Buddhism, it's not in other forms of Buddhism. Of course, you go in Chinese Buddhism or Japanese Buddhism, they don't have concepts like this. Emptiness of self, emptiness of what? You know, emptiness of other, what's that debate? For them, I think for the most part, just an emptiness of self-understanding. There's many different schools or traditions within that. But um, uh, where we went with this is that I'm just hoping to introduce these ideas because they're just so um, prevalent now. Um, and so what happens is, you know, people will read books, uh, let's say books by Solon Dalai Lama or other Galupa uh, Lamas or, you know, like uh, Lam Rim books, and then they'll read uh, Kagyu Ma Mudra books, let's say, or Nyingma Dzogchen books. And then what happens is a lot, so language is a little different, the conceptual map's a little different, and so people can get confused. Like, well, wait, what are they talking about here? It doesn't seem to make sense. So it's nice to know these two currents. So you can map it out yourself, see which one works for you, which one you like, which one you prefer as a study. And as I always like to, in a very vulgar way, say it, it's like the difference in understanding half a glass of water being either half empty or half full. I always feel in the big picture, um, these things uh, are therapeutic modalities to help you get enlightened. And you, we can sort of have big sort of conceptual or semantic or syntactical fights over all these concepts, but in the big picture, they're always pragmatic and always therapeutic, which means it's just different styles of what works with your mentality and spiritual background and what tradition seems to resonate or work with you. But again, before you know what does work with you, you have to know what the traditions are and what you like and what they mean. And the difference is between the two. Uh, Nisha, we said people that say everyone agree that we all agree with one are a bunch of idiots. So I, I, I can't remember the exact quote, but you meet some people. It's like, oh, all religions are the same. Everything's the same. All Buddhism's the same. Yeah, in the big picture, it's all the same. But in terms of <laughs> the, the specific maps we're using or recipes, there are differences, and sometimes there's important differences. And I, and it's not. Um, 
you know, we don't have to get scared or, or threatened by just saying that there's different ways and different styles and that they're all different medicines for different minds, which is why Buddha over the 50 years that he taught, taught so many different things in Buddhism and so many different outlooks and different ways. And I'm not going to get into it, but, you know, if there's a whole sad chapter to this uh, in Tibetan history. There's a lot of sectarianism, political sectarianism, because Tibet has, of course, a theocratic and feudal and tribal culture, culturally. And so there's a lot of very unpleasant um, uh, debates and polemics and even worse than that. But that shouldn't surprise you because that's what human nature is like. And if you take a time machine back, not even all that long, really basically to the first part, even the 20th century, right up until maybe the 1960s, sort of before the kind of ecumenism in uh, um, secularism we have in Western cultures, if you just read correspondence, uh, scholarly research, debates between Catholics and Protestants um, in uh, Christian culture in North America or Europe, you see all sorts of really sad, horrible sort of things that fights and everything else just on theology, theocratic things. And when you study Christianity, there's a huge difference between Protestantism and Catholicism on theology and um, in liberation and personal ethics and everything else, relationship to God. So it might not be that extreme, the difference between the uh, sort of emptiness of self, emptiness of other, but it, there is there are some differences. And in the big picture, we all become Buddha, we all get enlightened. But it's nice to see those differences. And I think it's really illuminating. And I think it's good just whatever tradition you're in, in Tibetan Buddhism, you can learn a lot from this. And again, my professor always said, don't think these thinkers and saints are as stupid as you are. So when you're reading it, this book, don't have, oh, Jay Sunkapa, what a dummy, you know, or Gorampa, oh, can't believe what an idiot that guy is, you know, making such an obvious mistake. These guys are two of the smartest people in Tibetan Buddhism. And we're just talking about a thin little book that's an introduction to it. And um Besides the fact that they're amazing saints, they're incredible thinkers and philosophers with this. So even if you don't sort of agree with what they're saying, you try and put yourself in their shoes. Like Heidegger would say, what questions are they trying to answer? What problems are they attacking? What what issue are they dealing with here? And it's really, really brilliant. So that's what I'm going to uh, look at for the next um, few little episodes here. So I'm going to try and here I am and blabbing away, but I'm going to try and keep these classes fairly short this time. I know I always say that, but it's a lot of material. So I actually just want to do sort of a quick a heart sutra, a uh, little bit of uh, meditation, a few prayers, and then get into it and present it shorter and then basically let you marinate in the material and think about it. Um, there's a great quote from Miles Davis, one of my big sort of music heroes, where, where he always said, one day, you know, I'm going to call myself on the phone and tell myself to shut up. And I've always remembered that quote. And of course, I'm very bad at applying that uh, advice to myself. But I don't want to just sit here and talk at you for an hour with this really heavy conceptual stuff, because I just know it's just going to be really, really hard to get through. And the last thing I want to do is make this stuff boring and irrelevant to you that you don't want to look at it, because it's actually really, really good. And in some ways, it's really, really important. We have to know what emptiness is. We have to know the relationship of the two truths. We have to know uh, how to realize emptiness, because that's how we get enlightened and escape our suffering. Okay, so let's... Um, do the Heart Sutra here. It's best thing to start. Homage to perfection of wisdom, the Blessed Mother. Thus I have heard. At one time, the Blessed One was dwelling in Raj Greer and Mass Vultures at Mount, together a great assembly of monks and nuns and a great assembly of bodhisattvas. That time, the Blessed One was absorbed in the concentration of countless aspects of phenomena called profound illumination. That time, also, Supreme Bhattacharya, the Bodhisattva, the Great Beings, looking perfectly the price of profound perfection of wisdom, looking perfectly also the five aggregates being empty of inherent existence. Then through the power of Buddha, Venerable Shari put to a sentence for Bhattacharya, the Bhattacharya, the Bhattacharya, the Great Being. How should a son of the lineage train who wishes to engage the price of profound perfection of wisdom? Thus he spoke, and Supreme Bhattacharya, the Bhattacharya, the Great Being, replied to Venerable Shari Putra as follows. Shari Putra, whatever son or daughter of the lineage wishes to engage in the price of profound perfection of wisdom, should look perfectly like this. Subsequently, looking perfectly and correctly, also the five aggregates being empty of here in existence. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. Likewise, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. 
Check a picture like this off now in our emptiness, having no characteristics. We're not producing, do not cease. They have no defilement, no separation from defilement, no, no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, and no consciousness. There is no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no object, no phenomenon. There is no eye element, so forth, that up to no mentality element, and also up to no element of mental consciousness. There is no ignorance, and no exhaustion of ignorance, and so forth, up to no aging and death, no exhaustion of aging and death. Likewise, there is no suffering, origin, cessation, or path. No insulted awareness, no attainment, also no non-attainment. Therefore, shared put you because there's no attainment, body sap is rely upon and abide in their perfection of wisdom. Their minds have no obstructions and no fear. Passing out of beyond perversity, attain the final nirvana. Also, all Buddhas reside perfectly and three times, having relied upon the perfection of wisdom, became manifest, complete Buddhas, and state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, equal to the equal mantra, the mantra that clearly pacifies all suffering, since it's not false, should be known as the truth. Mantra profession, a uh, mantra profession wisdom is proclaimed. Tayata, um, gotta gotta pair, gotta pair, some gotta go to so on. Shari put your body sap a great being should train the profound perfection wisdom like this. Then the blessed one arose in that concentration and said to Sri Vadakshara, the body sap of the great being that he'd spoken well. Good, good, O son of Lingen, like that. Since it's like that, just as you have revealed in that way, the profound perfection wisdom should be practiced, and Tathagatas will also rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra, Spirit of Alakshara, the Bodhisattva, the Great Being, to our circle of disciples as well as worldly beings, gods, humans, demigods, and spirits, were delighted and highly praised what had been spoken by the Blessed One. So we'll just take a moment here just to take refuge from our hearts. We can just say, I and all sentient beings, till we achieve enlightenment, go refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So on our behalf of ourselves and all beings, we are taking refuge in that the ultimate medicine or cure or liberation from our suffering faith in our three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Buddha as the example, Dharma as the teachings or the medicine, and the Sangha is our community to help us uh, realize this. And now taking a moment now to generate uh, the lichita. Everything that we're doing here, studying here, watching the video, all of our meditation, so forth, may be cause for the awakening of all sentient beings. I mean, we become Buddha that we lead all sentient beings to enlightenment as well. We see through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the benefit of all. Okay, so just feeling the presence of all the Buddhas and all of our teachers with us here. Let's just uh, chant the Gauti Mantra three times here. Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisattva Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisattva Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisattva. Okay, so may the Buddhists and our teachers uh, bless our mind uh, for this. Head. Again, uh, as they always say, any mistakes here are my mistakes. Anything good that happens is the blessing of all of our gurus, in particular these two great teachers, uh, founder of my tradition, Jay Sankapa and Gorampa as well, uh, Gorampa uh, Sonam Sangate. And again, um, the author here, that, that's so good, uh, Sonam Tatra, the um, uh, scholar or uh, sort of professor that wrote this, uh, it says, I'm trying to be as fair as possible, but it's kind of like, um, what do they call it? Full disclosure. He's like, I used to be a monk in a Gloop monastery. I hope he was in Sarah again. And so he's like, I do have a bit of a bias for Jason Kappa's view here. And I have to say full disclosure myself. If you're a big uh, fan and supporter uh, and follower of Gorampa Sonam Sange or big believer and lover of emptiness of um, other, 
uh, the Shentong view of emptiness in Tibetan Buddhism, Kargi Nyingma or whatever. And, you know, I have to say that, yes, I am a glupa and I do love Jay Sunkappa's presentation. But I actually really, really do like the emptiness of other position as well. I think it's really, really profound and wonderful. And I will continue to study it just on my own and just take the blessings I do from it. But I'm just saying if you're detecting sometimes even unconsciously a little bit of a bias and you know why that is. Okay, so just to start here, I just got a few notes. I just want to give a little bit of intro on what the five chapters of this book are about. And then we'll just sort of take it from there, uh, maybe about five classes or so, and then a review just on the um, on the material. So um, what uh, the author here, some Takcho uh, says is that um, the sort of the, the summit of uh, Buddhist philosophy, like we've been studying, the middle way consequentialist school or Mekamika Prasangika view of emptiness, which is sort of seen as the ultimate view of emptiness in Tibetan Buddhism. There's actually two radically distinct uh, uh, epistemological, ontological and soteriological or liberation approaches concerning this doctrine. So that's what's funny is that when you actually study Madhyamika Prasangika, it seems, when you're studying, it seems very straightforward. But what's interesting is you can have two radically do two different ways of interpreting it or seeing it. And it was interesting because uh, I didn't know this until I started studying. I thought it was just kind of coming from a blue point, maybe a little bit biased, that it was just quote unquote, obvious that it's just the one way the sort of glupa way of seeing it was the way it was until i started looking more into this and started saying oh my goodness there's a completely different way of seeing this that works just as well that's really really profound so of course these two approaches are best um uh, embodied or substantiated by uh, Lama Tsongkhapa, of course under our tradition 1357 to 1419 and gorampa Sa uh, sonam sangye Brittany sakya Teacher, uh, 1429 to 89. Okay, so with this all about the respective understanding of the two truths and the ontological stance of the two truths, conventional and ultimate reality. Also, they wrote about the epistem uh, epistemic or epistemological resources for accessing these two truths and the nature and possibility of knowledge of these truths and the implications all of this has for your personal and so the first chapter we look at here is um, what is it that is divided into the two truths? What are the two truths? Why are they divided? What are they? How are they related? The question is, are there two truths or really just one truth? And you'll see that this is the, sort of the crux of the matter here. So Tsongkhapa is a pluralist. There is, act, there is two truths and they are actual truths and they are mutually interlocking and non-hierarchical. So there's a relationship between them, sort of a horizontal relationship. One's not better than the other. They go together and they mutually um, uh, imply one another, like two sides of a coin, for instance. Both are equal, qua or as uh, ontologically equal or in epistemology. So both are equal, qua ontology and epistemology. So I'm at this point. Gorampa, on the other hand, is a monist. He believes rather than being a pluralist, two realities or two sides of something, there's only one. Conventional truth for Gorampa isn't truth. Ultimate truth alone is true. So the two truths are distinct and hierarchically ordered. One's better than the other. They're also, because of this, mutually exclusive. Ultimate truth precedes conventional truth in ontology and epistemology. Isn't that interesting? Chapter two. Um, so what, again, looking deeper into the two natures, the nature of the two truths. These are the two pressing geek, uh, pressing geek interpretations for, you know, for Tsongkhapa and Garampa here. So for Tsongkhapa, the two truths are based on two natures verified by empirically valid and ultimately valid cognition. So for Tsongkhapa, why there's two truths is each one of them can be grounded or verified or justified empirically like through your experience right so in other words there's a valid cognition we can test them and find if there's evidence for them right a promena for them a valid cognition uh, a mind that's not in error one that's not sort of like diluted or high on drugs or whatever like just with your normal logical empirical mind you can find evidence for both of these things 
but he does not reduce both of these truths uh, to the modes of cognition alone. Ultimate truth can't be metaphysically conditioned or reducible to an independent ultimate mode of uh, cognition, even though it may be unconditioned epistemologically. Okay. So it's interesting. What, what we'll see is that these two truths, even though they're one, are accessed by two different ways of, of cognition, two different minds, two different ways of, of just a sort of prominent, you could say, a conventional way of looking at things and an ultimate way of looking at things. So it's one thing that you can see two different ways, and they imply one another. Gorampa, though, on the other hand, breaks it down to a different uh, sort of distinction between ignorance or error and wisdom or truth. That's what determines the character of the two truths. This is how we define each of the two truths. So the two truths are underlaid and reducible to two conflicting modes of cognition. Ultimate truth is unconditioned metaphysically and is defined by an independent ultimate mode of cognition. Okay, Which makes it, for Garampa, it's a question of what's wrong and what's right, what's true and what's false. So the ultimate mode of cognition, the true way or wisdom way of seeing things, shows you that the other way of seeing things, the conventional way of seeing things, the empirical conceptual way of doing things, is dead wrong. So that's a huge difference between the two positions you can see between Tsongkhapa's and Gorampa. Chapter 3 is compares Tsongkhapa and Gorampa's position on the limits of language and conceptual thought. How does our our words and concepts fit in with all this. And what we'll see is that they are, they're so important for Songkhap, it's part of the whole equation to understanding emptiness. What Garampa will see is that sort of your empirical mind, your conceptual mind, your words are wrong, basically. They're limited, they're relative, they're like Maya, wall of illusion that you let go of when you go into this ultimate form of knowing, this wisdom mind that sees reality how it is in and of itself. So chapter four, by way of not seeing it, by way of transcending conceptual elaborations and by way of ascending to non-duality. Okay, so these are the three big things. Um, by way of transcending uh, concepts, by way of ascending to non-duality, by way of not seeing. So Tsongkhapa takes all these three modes together of knowing ultimate truth to establish that empirically given phenomena is accessible to the, sen accessible to the senses, our, empirically, our empirical experiential world are without essence or are relative or are changing, impermanent, are without any kind of ultimate nature. Therefore, they are dependent arisings. They're dependently arisen. As we know, we study this in Buddhism. That is their ultimate nature. So what's interesting is these three sort of modes of knowing by way of not seeing, by way of transcending conceptual aberrations, by way of uh, ascending to the non-duality. We see that once we study conventional nature itself, it reveals or discloses its ultimate nature, right? Going together here. Whereas Garampa does the opposite here. He mobilizes these three modes of knowing as a scaffold to ascend the met to, to metaphysical non-duality. Transcendent knowledge is utterly distinct from conventional knowledge. So we start, it's like in a Wittgensteinian sense, we're using a ladder to get over the wall and we drop the ladder. So we're starting in our experiential conceptual reality. And by looking at it, we drop it entirely to get to the ultimate reality. So knowledge of empirically given phenomena as dependent arising knowledge Transcendent ultimate uh, truth is non-dual must be distinct and contradictory. Okay, so I'll just elucidate my notes here. Knowledge of empirically given phenomena for Gorampa as dependently arisen, conventional reality, and knowledge of transcendent ultimate truth as non-duality are distinct, contradictory, and separate. So these two truths are separate. They're not related. And finally, uh, chapter five, what are the unique features of, the, of enlightened knowledge? Like when we're enlightened and know these two truths as a Buddha, what's that like for both of these two thinkers here? The way Buddha's mind works or perceives in relationship to these two truths. So this represents, um, some Takto says, this is the quote unquote climax of their disagreement. In other words, what's the Buddha's mind like? Both of them say, when you're enlightened, you see the true truths. 
That's what it means to be enlightened. That's what it means to be a Buddha. So the question is, what are you seeing as a Buddha? And so you think, well, obviously everyone agrees on that one, right? But then what you see is what Salkapa says when you're a Buddha, what you see is very different than what Garampa says you see of the Buddha. So for Sankapa, enlightenment is the perfection of wisdom of empirically or experientially given phenomena from both an empirical and ultimate standpoint. The two truths, conventional and ultimate reality, are in perfect equilibrium of knowledge here, of cognition or pramana. So what you see is you see, as when you're enlightened, both truths simultaneously and see their interdependence. That's what you see when you're a Buddha. And that's what we can't see as normal sentient beings. We have two separate cognitions. We either know conventional reality or go into deep samadhi and know ultimate reality. Buddhas know both directly, non-conceptually, simultaneously at the same time. They see both at the same time. Rapa, however, says there is a breach between the true truths. So with enlightenment, conventional world and its knowledge disappear entirely. And one is conscious only of a transcendent absolute. So in other words, for Garampa, conventional reality is false. It's wrong. It's error. It's illusion. So when you're a Buddha, do you see that? Of course you don't. All you see is ultimate truth or non-duality. All you see is wisdom. You don't see words and concepts. That's quite different, isn't it? Isn't that interesting? I don't know. I just think that this is so interesting. So, um, so I'm just going to let you guys think about that. And again, who's right, who's wrong, that's up for you guys in your own practice to decide or, or which one you like, which seems more reasonable to you. But really, really think about this. And again, see that both positions are really smart. Both both positions here. Like when I read Korampa's position, I'm like, even though I agree with some campus, I'm like, that's really good. That's really cool. The difference between wisdom and falsity, wisdom and error, wisdom and ignorance. How can they be the same thing? How can you know both at the same time? When you have wisdom, there wouldn't be an ignorance. When everything's dark and you put on the light, where does the darkness go? Or as Wittgenstein says, when I untie a knot in a piece of rope, I'm, I've got my shoelaces or in a knot, I untie it, where does the knot go? So that's really, really intimate. So I'm just, I'm, I'm putting that out there. You guys start thinking about it, see what you think. And uh, we're going to go in a little bit deeper. So uh, next time we'll talk about uh, sort of go into a deeper presentation of what the two truths are for both of these uh, thinkers, Sankapa and Garampa, and their relationship. And, uh, and what does that mean for emptiness? Okay, thanks for coming. And um, let's just take a moment to dedicate all this for the awakening of all sentient beings. And again, for our own study of emptiness and our own um, uh, our own experience of uh, ultimate truth and emptiness. And we always ask for the blessings of all of our gurus and the Buddhists. Please bless our mind, enlighten us, inspire us, help us study, help us get this. So blessings of all holy beings, truth of karma, private peace of your intention, and all the Dharma wishes. Okay, and we'll see you next time.